Hello, and welcome to Talking Two Ways. I am your co-host, Tyler, and with me is my co-host, Al. Hey, the translation is in Seneca. In English, it is, hello, I am thankful you are well. My name is Alec. Talking Two Ways is a project that Al and I started to make a place for us to discuss Native American cultures, histories, and current events, uh, as well as to give a voice to a population that deserves and needs it. Personally, it is a place for me, a white guy approaching 30, to ask questions and listen to as many Native American perspectives as possible. As a talkative guy, I am going to try to focus on that so that I am not the colonizer in the room. Al, how about you? I want to do this project because I have grown up in a Seneca home, uh, in a half half white home. My mother is Seneca, and my father is white, so I've grown up in both worlds, really not knowing about either. So I'd like to know more about my, my deeper heritage and share it with everyone else as I learn. I think it's a, a great personal topic for you and me, because Al's father is my godfather, so I've always been over at his house and saw the reservation growing up, and it was kind of just a place that was a accepted part of my life. So now that I'm an adult, it's nice to explore the things that I didn't really understand about it and get a deeper understanding of of, of what it means to to live with a different another people like that and what they go the, what they went through. I, I hope to understand it myself because I've mostly grown up in my father's world with uh, tidbits of my mother, but now that I'm uh, on my own and <laughs> be able to learn it myself without say, like a parent overshadowing or not so much controlling what I learn, but keeping an eye on what I learn and what I say. Now I can pick it for myself. There's a power on that. I'm glad we're, I'm glad we're exploring it together. So I, I hope you enjoy our, our journey with this and uh, join us for the ride. Welcome to Talking Two Ways. Welcome. How you been? I've been good. I needed a little extra time because I wanted to, f- I needed to finish up a paper for college. That's always a good reason to to be a little late to recording. Uh, <laughs> kind of jumping right into it. What uh, what kind of paper? Or what or do you, what do you want to share about it? Uh, it was a counselor wellness paper. Um, we had to reflect on our own personal career goals, and then describe and define burnout in the human services field and then go into how we are going to prevent ourselves from falling too much victim to burnout, which was kind of really easy to go into having experienced burnout myself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a dad, that kind of just comes with the the territory to a certain extent. <laughs> but also other times you've expressed that you've felt burnout. Oh, yeah. So it wasn't too bad. Three pages, three or four pages. So I, lo- I love that that's coming, becoming normalized, especially in the education. Like I, I my education was was specifically about like a a, a science of, of wellness and well being and acknowledging the the processes and that. So I'm not. It's kind of not surprising that being able like understanding like, hey, when you're sick, don't come to the place where there's people with com- compromised commu- uh, immune systems. Stay home and take a day. That's also just a self help thing and how to make sure that you can stay up a, a proper, not even just caretaker, but human. Um, but it's cool that it's, it's in other aspects of education. And I mean, especially, I guess, in your, in your field, that's kind of an important thing to make sure you do. Yeah. Cause the thing that they really were expanding upon was if you're going to be helping these people, the only way you can efficiently, help them to the best of your ability is to be well, both physically and mentally for yourself. Um, which is something I expanded upon, especially the physical aspect, like the mental aspect. I got it. I've been practicing that for a while, but the physical part, I look down, I see my stomach. I'm like, Oh no, <laughs> I need to get, get out and go for more walks. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah, that's harder, especially with it becoming closer and closer to winter. I, I, I mean, oh, closer yeah. to fall. Fall hasn't technically started yet. You still got some time. Oh, I'm so excited for it, man. <laughs> fall is a, is a really good time. It's mine and Sierra's favorite season. It's fall. Oh, mine too. Jess's too. Um, we're gonna, we've got a couple of photo shoot things going on this fall. <laughs> I don't think this will get back to her. Um, I'm, I'm organizing like a surprised boudoir shot for Jess. 
what does that mean? Uh, it's just, you know, like, she gets dressed up all fancy pretty and gets her hair done up and goes to, uh, there's a, I'm, I'm whispering now thinking she might hear me. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> it's a, it's a boudoir, uh, it's just a, a boutique, um, uh, oh my gosh, S- uh, sweetheart pinups, oh my gosh, what's it called? I don't, I don't know what that word is, I've heard it, but I don't know what it, what, like, wh- which specifically, one? which one, boudoir. Boudoir. Uh, it's it's just a, it's a style of photography. It's a um, honestly, it's a little more risque or just not like straight up nudity, but it, it's it's tasteful, tasteful hot photos. I don't know, man. Oh, hell yeah! Is it Victorian? <laughs> uh, there. It sounds like a Victorian word. That's uh, the first thing that came to my mind. Be. I mean, hey, I guess we're looking at this now. But anyway, the, uh, real quick, the place is Sweetheart Pinup. It's in a place in uh, in Tonawanda. I'm, I'm, oh, okay. I was talking with Destiny there. She seems really cool. We're gonna get something organized. I'm working with uh, Jess's other partners to to you know <laughs> going on it together and get her a nice uh, birthday surprise in October. So that's something we're gonna be doing fun in in the fall. But let's just nice. look up B O U D O I R. I I spelled Doudoir. it Doudoir. Doudoir is different. Doudoir. Is that the male version? <laughs> it might be. <laughs> Definition. Okay. A woman's bedroom or private room. So, it it I guess it's technically like, it's a it's a pho- photography style that it that emulates that kind of privacy. There are photos that you that might be for a special someone, or they're just not ones you would have out. I guess like when family's coming over, but. It's a, yeah, they're not hanging up on the wall over Thanksgiving dinner. No, uh, I mean sometimes <laughs> depends on the dinner. But uh, depends she, on the family. <laughs> she is a. Uh, have you ever heard of the Suicide Girls? Yes, you yeah. actually. That's something you told me about oh, yeah. a while ago. Is that she wanted to be one of yeah. one of those? She she's a hopeful, and she's got a couple of sets um, up there. She's sort of taking it easier with her current job, but she's you know still enjoying it and, and loving that stuff and loving expressing herself and I'm all about supporting the hell out of that stuff so if I can make a fun birthday surprise out of it I'm gonna for sure do that oh, um, heck yeah. but you know any every fall is you know she's got a birthday so I got something fun going on um, I'm also gonna get her a popcorn machine <laughs> oh, dude those are wait what kind the like fucking the carnival style like you know it's got a bucket awesome. you put the bucket in the put the corn in the bucket and stuff oh yeah and that you know what I can did it i without even thinking i segued i did it now speaking of corn say corn that like is corn. that is today's episode corn corn is the thing i can get behind <laughs> no <laughs> it's thing no it's the, the thing you put, it's the thing you put in your mouth the ears the oh, oh yeah the kernels heck yeah <laughs> So, yeah, and a little, uh, I don't know, fun idea that we kind of had. We're, ha- we're having an episode about corn. Corn, it's made an impact on our life. That's, I mean, that's going to be our, our big kind of argument for why we're spending a certain amount of time talking about corn. I do have a couple of uh, stories or, or, you know, snippets from books that I wanted you to react to, but seeing as I just segued so, so smoothly... Uh, and, and, and and neatly into this uh, topic. We're just going to hit it hard. Um, Heck yeah. So, corn. Corn is old. Corn has been around for a while. Uh, selective breeding and, and dis- after the discovery of corn has been like since 8,000 BCE. It's, it's one of the oldest uh, cultivated and uh, domesticated, well not domesticated, uh, cultivated and g- genetically modified plants that we've had in existence uh, like second to wheat basically which says a lot uh, the it's space it's a type of sweet grass I looked up so much more about corn than I thought I ever would it is uh, <laughs> but we're doing it so I have references <laughs> so I'll tell you what wait corn is a sweet grass yeah it's well it's a, I'm sorry uh, sweet corn it's, okay, it's okay. a it's a cereal grass, so it is from it's it's a type of grass family, but just like wheat, it's kind of in the same subcategory of wheat. Like the kernels are basically like the same thing that the seeds of wheat are that we you know thresh from 
the you know the chaff or whatever and make into bread. That makes sense. Cornbread. So like back in when it was first discovered, it was it was much more like uh, I, don't know, I guess comparing it to, again to the wheat plant, it was much more like that where the 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 kernels weren't like big fat kernels full on a cob it was much more just like a stalk of of grass but over the course of generations of thousands and thousands of years of selective breeding and cultivation it has just become more and more uh tasty i guess like the the idea of sweet corn that is one of the most recent genetic shifts because of uh like scientists and selective breeding and G- GMO and shit um, g- historically speaking did not have a sweet taste so we're kind of lucky we're in, we're in the we're in the, the golden era of corn al heck yeah i'll live in the golden era of corn this sounds awesome <laughs> uh, maize also known as corn and indian corn hey oh is uh, oh any of the device cultivated forms of the annual cereal grass family tosine Posei, P O A C E A E, of the species Z maize. Uh, maize. The seed of this plant, which grows as a uh, large grain set in rows on an ear or cob. <laughs> okay, let's see. Physiology. Yeah, like half of Idaho, and oh, you know, Idaho is the potato. Yeah. Idaho is mostly for potatoes, states. but most uh, most every state has some sort of corn production in it. Uh, there's some major uh, farming production in America. It's just dedicated to corn. Uh, something I learned when looking up the physiology of this, because, I mean, if you've seen corn, you know how it grows. It's got a stalk, ears come out of it, there's leaves that like the sun. But the uh, the frilly stuff, <laughs> the top is the, is the, the, the male part of the plant. That gives the off little the little hairs. Yeah, no, no, not not the not the hairs on the end of a co- corb, uh, of a cob of corn. That on the very top of the stalk, the little uh, oh. the frilly kind of just like looks like seeds or it looks like pollen things, and that's exactly what it is. That's the male st- uh, stigmata, I believe. I'm getting if I'm getting names wrong, whatever. Uh, but that's that part is also I don't know, genetically evolved to be designed to attract bees and stuff. It gets really tall and gets really big and sways in the wind really easy to catch be, uh, the attention of bees and other pollinating insects. The pollen from that part has to get onto the hair of the corn, of, of the cob on the corn, for it to kind of uh, be fertilized, and there has to be like one, I don't know, one piece of pollen for each cob or each kernel, basically, and it kind of, like, gets stuck in that hair and pro- <laughs> processes and f- or whatever gets f- absorbed into the plant that way. That's a lot of fertilization. Uh, yeah, yeah. C- corn is kind of crazy. It's Corn gets down. Corn gets down. Corn gets around. All right. I like corn. Corn is a very important part of the Seneca culture. It um, it's one of the three sisters. Uh, is corn, beans, and squash. Those were like the main agricultural plants that we the vegetables that yes vegetables that we ate, and it evolved into what we now call corn husk dolls, which. The story behind corn husk dolls is that there was this beautiful young girl who used to walk around her village all the time, flaunting around, I'm the most beautiful girl in the world, and she was very vain about herself. And one day, one of the, um, for lack of a better term, shamans, she had visited her, and basically the shaman said, you need to stop being so vain, or your beauty will be taken away. Well, the, the, the girl didn't listen. And then one day when she, when the girl went down to the river to wash herself, she couldn't see her own reflection. And she was 
brought great sadness about this, but was also taught a very important lesson about it, n not that beauty is fading, is fleeting, and that just because you're beautiful doesn't make you the most important person in the world. And um, so she started making cornhouse dolls out of the husks of corn. And um, that's the origin story of cornhouse dolls, which are still made to this day by people, on the, at least I know of the, uh, the Seneca Reservation down there in Western New York. I mean, yeah, your, your family has, you've made cornhouse dolls before, haven't you? Yes, with very big heads and very little arms. <laughs> <laughs> my mother, she teaches a, a course um, to schools. Actually, it's not just my mom. It's my mom, my two aunts, and my nana. They go to different schools around the area, and they teach elementary to middle school students how to make cornhouse dolls, as well as when they go to powwows, they usually get invited to set up a stand. And they'll get paid for it, plus whatever customers pay for the materials, which is usually like 10 to $15, plus the course of getting taught how to make a cornhouse doll. Nice. And then they get to take that home with them. Um, there are some of them that I know my aunt has made that you can get them fully dressed up, and they, they, don't ha they never have faces on them. But uh, the ones that she has made and that my great-grandmother has made um, – they are dressed up in the regalia that we wear today as well as regalia that we used to wear way back in the day and they would cut their own hair to put on the doll for 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 putting the Ooh. hair on there cuz you don't you don't want to use artificial hair it's i don't know the implications behind it but i was always told if you're going to put hair on it always put real real hair on there uh, I don't know if it has something to do with respecting the doll or a connection to the doll. I mean, I, I would say that's that's a pretty good like way of having at least a personal connection with it. That's we uh, that's kind of something that's prevalent in in other cultures, especially. I'm just you know, voodoo just comes to mind. Um, yeah. Whether whether accurately or uh, inaccurately represented, uh, how you know voodoo actually works. That's something that sticks out. Uh, oh yeah, that yeah. Cornhouse dolls are not like the um, uh, <laughs> no, the, the the voodoo dolls that are portrayed in media where you stick a needle at it and cause them pain. No, that's that's not what they are. They're just yeah. There, there's to, there's there's other Seneca myths that have that sort of stuff. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> other ways this to is curse. A good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To to me, especially with um. Oh my gosh. Now thinking back, it must have been at least like. Uh, uh, only like eh, maybe even just like 10 15 minutes tops but i just i remember your mom just going through the few like you had them all set up you like the, you had them all out it was around christmas time i think your family gets them all out every year or at least this year they had them like all the ones that they had access to um and even i think some of the ones that were like either going to or from the smithsonian or something along those lines uh, and she was just going through and telling me all the different ones, and these ones are in this sort of style. This ones, these are in this regalia, and just oh, that that stuck with me, and just how intricate they all were. It was it was very much. Uh, if they had faces, they would have been creepy. I think I th I can see back in the day when like the corn husk doll tradition maybe started, maybe after that princess was just like okay, trying out her thing. Maybe the first few that she made. Like she tried faces and she's like, oh, no. she put two of them like next to each other and thought, oh no, 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 that no, no faces. That would be they're looking at me wherever I am in the room. They're 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 they're, they're they know more than they should, and I don't want that. I don't want to bring that into other houses. So no faces. That, oh, okay, no face. It looks cute. It looks like an abstract painting, and you get to represent some sort of style instead of having this creepy series of faces probably all the same face just endlessly staring at you yeah if they if they did that it would be really creepy to walk into the uh so what you're talking about uh for christmas coming over to my ma's house is um every year we put out a bunch of different like they love to do the christmas village and it'll go around like four or oh, five yes. different plastic tables then when my grandfather was my great-grandfather was alive he'd put out a train 
and he'd go all the way around. And the specific one you're talking about is instead of the traditional baby in the manger, oh, like, yes. like, like my great grandfather had, we had a Native American version of that, which was cornhouse dolls. Yes, um, that was so cool. We still have that. <laughs> we put it up every year. What a what what a unique blend. Like right from the history that I've been seeing, like the the specifically like when you're talking about history of 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 you know interactions of peoples on this continent, there's usually a lot of like bloodshed and sometimes bad blood, but like what an odd take on like I that. Mean, it, it works. They we we love it and that's just how people right. work like that's just how people get st- like they doesn't matter what kind of either hardship or anything good or bad is is on their lives They'll, people take it and they turn it into something good yes and that's that's exactly what that mix is cuz great grandfather super catholic or i don't know the difference between the two super catholic or christian but all at the same time Super Seneca, Super Lakota, Super Native American. So it was the perfect blend, especially for Christmas. Um, and it's always very calming when it's nighttime and you have the Christmas lights lit around it. And there's the little bulb in the middle for the fire. And you look in there and there's the little baby cornhouse doll and the mom and, and the dad and then all the family surrounding it. Uh, it's I love it. We should write our, um, we should, we should write our own uh, a, a Seneca Christmas story. <laughs> oh my god that would be awesome <laughs> with, with, with a whole lot less bloodshed <laughs> oh gosh yeah oh, I mean uh, yeah not sure how much bloodshed is from like the current version is in the current version of the Christmas story but probably in the OG one anyway moving on uh, uses for corn one you eat it it's, it's very it's a good, good. One. There's the uh, the myth that uh, it's not very uh, nutrition not very nutritionally uh, valuable, so it doesn't it just you just kind of hold it for a while, or just move it for a really? while. Yeah, that's just, I mean, that's just a bad, dirty, toilet humor joke. But uh, <laughs> lately, people have been using it as a biodiesel to make ethanol. That's kind of one of the futures of fuel because we're going to be running out of the other stuff eventually. Oh yeah, I do remember hearing that at the gas station. That like the ten percent ethanol. That's that's made with corn. And, mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Oh, we got corn in our tank. I'll take it. Uh, yeah, that's kind of crazy. How how people can use. I don't know. Scientists are crazy. The way we can find ways and use uh, uses for a a plant. Uh, so eating. Eating, um, uh, industrial uses, fuel, gra- yeah. uh, grain, you know, used to make uh, corn tortilla chips, burritos, oh, heck very yeah. important, cornstarch, cornstarch is very important. It's all these things that, like, mostly people are going to be like, what the f- who cares? Corn oil, this, this is just all stuff that, like, has been around for forever, but um, the corn stalks, other than the actual, like, ear itself, the corn stalks can be used, uh, made uh, into paper. Or wallboard. The husks are used as filling material. Material cobs can be used to make fuel or to make charcoal, um, and in preparation of industrial solvents. Ooh. And then they're ta- Ooh. And also this uh, Britannica.com also talks about uh, husk dolls and using them as a art form. There's a spooky one. Ooh, spooky. Was it? What do you got? High fructose corn syrup. Oh yes, the dangerous one. That's when, <laughs> uh, honestly, if anything, that that's just an example of when you take anything that's good and you just process it too much and try to still then think it think of it as food. I've just in in general, that's just not really, just not r- really worked out to be an actual good plan. As far as, sure, it lasts longer, but that's like usually a bad food for you. Or if, if you if you have too much of it, it's it's generally going to be a bad thing. But that can also be said about anything. Right, that probably goes back to when um, the Great Depression was happening and people weren't able to afford vegetables and all of a sudden everybody came back and, uh, well, their, the soldiers needed it and then everybody came back and they needed a way to... to feed all those people. Feed all those people. They they 
ran out the local small farms and made big farms but in order to transport it from point a to point b they needed a way for it to stay fresh and uh high fructose corn syrup oh yeah it's gonna get you even just even just the 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 size of our cunt of, of the united states that we have to like move things from point a to point b is so much that just the the need to preserve things for that long kind of makes sense uh My brain deactivated. Corn. Corn. Corn oil. <laughs> corn oil can be incorporated into soaps, paints, and inks. You can use corn for everything. Oh, heck yeah. It's a miracle plant. It's a miracle plant. It's also pretty good. Uh, it is. I like it with butter on it. Oh, it's not too. very healthy, but it's delicious. And then you like, it's, throw a little bit of salt on there. It's all right. Oh, my God. It's, it's not that bad for you. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a starchy, starchy vegetable. It's still... Uh, no, I'm doing the, with the butter on it. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, the butter. Get 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 some get some other but olive oil, Ol- olive oil. Uh, okay, popcorn was developed in 3,600 BCE. Popcorn has been around for a while. Popcorn is that old? I did not think popcorn was that old, but yeah, it um, it's been around for a while. Jeez, I thought popcorn was like a Victorian era invention uh no maybe maybe the uh the the um the stoves and the things to cook them and how and and you know the cast iron things and 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 tools to make them and stuff were all developed in that time actually the the one of the next dates that i see here uh 1494 spread of corn to europe so that kind of would line in with with it spreading throughout europe and becoming more and more popular that royalty and higher-ups would be commissioning or you know having the creation of these different tools made around those times is corn native to just Amer- the americas it, uh or yeah is, Meso- it uh, mesoamerica like mexico area for the most part it, it. it's it's native to there and spread out uh throughout the uh the americas as a whole um it that lines up with the christopher columbus days <laughs> Yes, yes, it does. Uh, but yeah, it's it's basically fed like this part of the world for a majority of of human development, uh, and that's kind of a thing that's worth conserving. Um, so thinking of all this, looking at this timeline, most of all of its history is is like to the left, and then all the way to two thousand eight, fast corn. Fast corn. The functional analysis system system for trials. Fast allows corn plants to grow to maturity in a fraction of the time, approximately two months compared to more than one hundred days in field conditions. So that's when, like two thousand eight is when you start getting either genetically modified or um selective breeding enough to where you've just got corn that's just s- sucking nutrients out of the ground and producing corn that fast, and you can do that in like two cycles in certain parts of the United States at least, not maybe not in western New York area, because our growing season is kind of shit, but um, in other areas you can just get tons and tons and tons of corn, but also all those nutrients sucked out of the dirt that much faster. Uh, so that kind of makes sense with the issues that we've been hearing, or at least that I've been hearing about with uh, the dirt not being like soil not having enough nutrients to support plant growth, um, fields drying up, not having enough good soil to grow anything, uh, but also like the response to that of the increase of science and how we make good dirt, good soil. Composting is becoming like a common skill set. And again, like I've got a compost pile out back for the, the, my garden. Oh yeah, my, my stepmom has one of those. Uh, a composter and I've seen a couple people on YouTube uh, in Norway and they had made compost for three years um, in, in their backyard and they were they were growing the same thing corn and um, what are the little tomatoes a cherry cherry tomatoes they're growing a bunch of that yeah I had, I had a bunch I was lucky to get a bunch of cherry tomatoes again this year um, yeah the I mean Honestly, if I can keep it up, the idea is to basically not have to 
buy dirt uh, from any like Home Depot, Value, any of those wonderful stores that are amazing to have the option to be able to go and purchase stuff that you need for that stuff, uh, you know, for gardening. But uh, that is that is still taking dirt, aka nutrients, from somewhere else and bringing it to where you want it. Whereas whenever we have any food or make any food waste or scraps or whatever that we would just normally throw in the trash, that's stuff that we could throw in a compost and bring back to the dirt. So I can't tell you how much less trash I've been throwing out. I only have to bring out the garbage can for trash like once a month and even in the summer that it it doesn't smell because it's just like not stuff that will rot. Anything that will compost, I put in my composter and then throw into the compost pile and it rots there away where no one can smell it, where the dogs can't get to it, and I have made it so that animals can't get into it, and it's, like, pretty cool to not have smelly garbage in the house all the time. Oh, man. Once we get a house, I really want to get a composter so we can do that. Dude, Especially just, with the, a pile. the scraps that we have. Well, I, what would I do with the compost? Um, ah, okay. I want to be able to use it, and kind of do what you're doing and start a garden just to have more connection with the ground around me other than what I have now walking on it being a part of it it'd be it'd be nice to be able to grow something and see that I can do that because well, I've had a terrible here's what here's done. what here's what you do honestly if you just grab I mean just to not sorry to cut you off but if you just want to even start composting is a great way to start with the garden because you need to have that stuff rot and go, you know, bad and, and get like, um, like shredded paper and, and old dirt and, you know, dry sandy dirt on top of that stuff for a couple of months, especially over the, over the winter months before like the next season, then you can have that. Um, but also just like if you get like a, just a, a metal trash bin and just every time you have scraps from like dinner or something, just, uh, where you, where from what I know of your back porch you can even just like put it like at the bottom or even underneath your porch and just have it in there and make make sure that it's closed enough to where nothing get in, can get into it and once things rot enough then the animals won't get into it cuz it'll be all like liquid and stuff and you can just okay. throw it into the woods somewhere or like even just farther enough away that's still putting stuff back into in, uh, into the into the ground it's just right Making sure Getting that it's it not like, Earth. yeah. I'll, I'll sh- I get nice to I get to show you some stuff later too. Okay. The only reason I say once we have our own house is so we can actually use it for gardens because we're not allowed to make one here. Does the compost attract flies? Uh, yes, that's why I like having the metal like bin with the lid that seals because that. Keep, like at least has enough of an airtight seal where it doesn't have flies coming all the way over it, you know, all the way out of it all the time. But when I like open it up, especially in the hot summer day, there's like maggots and stuff crawling over inside. Uh, but ah, uh, okay, I'll, I'll have to handle that. Sierra cannot every time oh. she sees a maggot, she's like, ah, no, uh, uh-uh, Alec, no, yeah. it, it's your turn. <laughs> okay, but yeah, <laughs> I'll do but the dirty work. once once that kind of like <laughs> once stuff sits in like that been for a while and comes kind of mushy and liquid and stuff and i i honestly anytime like we have like tissues or paper towels like it's so much waste for like to us to use a paper towel and then just like throw it in the trash because that just goes to a landfill i put that in just like another bin that just has like paper waste and stuff um all the tissues that i use throughout the day or whatever whenever i'm sick um that goes into the trash bin and then like those food scraps get thrown on top of that or vice versa and that just helps stuff break down, and that's just more, uh, like, fibrous materials for things to break down and stuff that's good for plants when it eventually all breaks down and just gets into, uh, turns into dirt. I will have to look into that. We have plenty of scraps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. With kids, like, any kid under five, you make a big, full plate of dinner for them, and they're just like, all right, they have one bite of one thing, and they're like, I'm done, whatever. And they want oh, yeah. dessert. Oh, yeah. Oh, bastards. You don't get dessert? <laughs> Not until you finish your dinner that I made too much of it for you. <laughs> I made enough for me, for you. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> we 
Oh, I always make too much. On I don't. I gotta stop making too much. Um, smaller, smaller portions for all of them. Yeah. yeah. I give myself smaller portions too. Yeah, only half, only half a cob of corn. Wrapping it back in. All right. Is there anything else that we wanted yes. to talk about with corn? Oh, um, just a little bit of gloating about my mom, really. Hell yeah. <laughs> she has been making corn husk uh, flowers. So she'll take the corn husk and my Nana will dye them in water and food coloring so they'll be different oh, colors. Cool. And then she'll fold those into different bouquets. And she actually won second place at the fall festival um, at the sailor building in, uh, nice. or not, in, in uh, on the reservation for them. And then a couple of them got into the Salamanca Seneca Museum. Oh, that is so cool. And, yeah. Th- thank you. <laughs> yeah. She's, um, she's also selling them on the side. So it, if you're interested, <laughs> give, give me, a, yeah, give. send me the link to that. I'll, I'll include it on this episode. Oh, heck yeah. That's so cool. Um, Good for her. That's what, what a, like that's taking your heritage, taking your culture and using it in like, cur- using it in current ways, reflecting on current times. Like that's, that's, I can totally see like an Instagram short video on like the how to on how to do that. Like first you soak the corn husks, then you dye them, then you let them dry. And then you start like, <laughs> I, I could see her making that kind of video too. Oh, she'd love it. If she, if she, I gotta help her figure out how to do that because they have a stand and like a tripod and everything for a phone and be perfect. Just It'd be excellent for her to outreach to other uh, nations. Oh yeah, hey, that's you can honestly do this. how to do it. Like, uh, they've just been trying to keep up on like how <laughs> keep up on how them kids are <laughs> are doing things. And honestly, even from our our generation or from from us, like even just seven ten years ago when things with like phones and apps and, and different uh, systems were being used. It was, you could very easily tell that it was just like a kind of a rolling system of like, Oh, okay. People are on vine. And now people nowadays don't know what vine is. And there's just always a new thing sort of happening with a couple of staples or standstills that sort of evolve (laughs) with the time or with the times. Um, Back in my day, there was the MySpace. (sighs) Oh my God. MySpace. (laughs) That's so weird how that's the old thing now that's like the like i mean it was already old when i was like interested in it it's just like oh okay this is a thing to do i tried to get into it i just couldn't it's a lot I easier seen, on your phone <laughs> i'd seen all that well I, yeah my mom and dad wouldn't buy me an actual phone to be able to handle that plus where we lived it was the only house in the area that couldn't get internet that wasn't HughesNet, the satellite internet, which is already bad. Slow as hell. So, slow as hell and expen- more expensive than inline internet. So <laughs> on the phone, I just couldn't. I seen what it was doing to other people around me, and I wasn't, wasn't about it. <laughs> it might be weird to say now, but um, one of my sayings or philosophies back then was if you really want to talk to me or get a hold of me here's my phone number or you know where to find me i isn't that how, see, isn't it crazy that's how that's so untrue like don't freaking call me don't call me now <laughs> i'm busy i have children like like if anyone called like tried to call you for any little thing oh yeah i'd be like would have words with them a message <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'll get back to you late, later tonight when they're asleep. Yeah. <laughs> and My it's not God. like because I don't want them to hear the kids in the background. It's. <laughs> uh, if anything, you're being present with your kids. That, that and that's <laughs> it. That's it. Being present with them. As soon as Dad gets a phone call, who is it? Can I talk to them? <laughs> is it Gamma? Is it Auntie Lissa? I want to yeah, talk to them. It's for them. <laughs> I want to. It's no. It's none of those people. I want to talk to them, but what you don't know them. <laughs> it's, it's it's the landlord. I want to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> and then if I give them the phone, they either sit there Go away. and talk on it for fifteen, or, yeah, or they run away. <laughs> they run away with the phone. Yeah. And, all right. Well, I guess I'm waiting here for ten minutes. <laughs> but but that is a great consistent delay tactic for any phone call you need like hey if there's some like bill collector oh say like, oh yeah hang on hold on, i'll talk to this guy <laughs> <laughs> oh 
Oh my god, I never thought of that. Really? <laughs> no, you only so get bad. that for a little bit longer. I do. I don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> right. Oh my god. Oh man, corn is good. <laughs> my space is old and corn is good corn is yeah corn is one of those staples that sticks with us as a society anyway that's right it's never okay. going out of fashion all right we we still got a bit of time but i i have a i i've been reading again i know dangerous dangerous uh uh tendency for me to have but i'm now on uh another book this one i think i might have read it for you uh, the the title for you before but i just i saw it on a thrift shop or something, and I was just like, oh, that's that's coming home with me. Healers on the Mountain and Other Myths of Native American Medicine. Ooh. So, you know, I did... I, the the author is Teresa... I'm going to pronounce it wrong. Pajon? P-I-J-O-A-N. Pajon? Okay. Pajon? Whatever, I'm not sure. Uh, from New Mexico. Uh, it's a bunch of different stories... Uh, it's got different uh, d- 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 stories of dreams and medicine, stories of myths, stories of chants, stories of vision quests, stories of healing myths, um, and the index kind of has which which uh, tribe or society or culture that it, it is it is derived from. Uh, so I just immediately was like, oh, cool! I have I have names. I can see if there's anyone that I know. Um, I, there's a couple Ojibwe, or at least there is an Ojibwe that I'm seeing. Um, bu- 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 there's a couple, a couple of Cher- uh, Cherokee, Navajo, Kiowa, Mount, um, Montana Blackfoot, a uh, Blackfeet, sorry, um, Sia, T-S-I-A, Sia, Pueblo, uh, and also just other Pueblo, so there's obviously different subcultures of Pueblo that are represented here, and I believe she is of the Pueblo, of, of Pueblo descent, or she is descent of a Native American tribe in New Mexico, because I just, I don't know, I have the instinct to just, like, make sure it's not just someone trying to appropriate the culture or stories or something, especially if it's the title Healers on the Mountain couldn't be very on the nose if it's not a Native American writer, I guess, in my eye. I, I, don't, I don't know why I have a why I have this hill to die on. Um, Sounds like a classic rock song. What? Healers on the Mountain. Oh, <laughs> Maybe a Greta Van Fleet song. They've been doing that so, kind of stuff. Yeah. I love it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but the the thing that I, you know, I'm just reading through all these, and it's like Cherokee, Pima, Navajo, Hope, uh, Hopi, Hope, or Hopi. Um, and I'm like, ah, oh, come on. What is this? And then, in Healing Myths, chapter 6, page 196, Skeleton Boy of the Iroquois. So, I went ahead and read that one first. And I would like to sum it up and see if you had heard it before. Um, if you'd like to react to it, if there's any sort of aspects you've mentioned or that you've uh, heard of before. Uh, sure, what do you think? let's hear it. Awesome. So I, I'm not going to read the whole story, and I do, but I do want to make sure I mention uh, part of the introduction that she sort of starts the entire book off with, kind of talks about this, uh, the subject or the aspect of especially our oldest, uh, you know, humanity's oldest cultures, stories, myths, um, the idea of plot, of, like, an, a, a narrative arc structure is very much a new concept in, in writing for people, for humanity, uh, and it's very much not how people told stories back in the day, and, and a lot of these stories kind of fall into that previous kind of... Uh, category of of storytelling where there's a lot to be up to interpretation as to what is actually happening what's going on what it is that you're supposed to, the message you're supposed to be getting kind of all of it is up in the air so uh for the sake of time i'm just not going to read everything but i am going to kind of give the slight America, United States American view of just summarizing the plot where it's kind of not exactly about the plot. So I, I encourage you to uh, find Skeleton Boy somehow online. I did try to look up a couple of things and didn't really find all that much but I can also just read it to you sometime otherwise or just let you read the book. Um, okay. 
uh, but it is a tale of a little nephew who lived with an old man in the dark woods. The old man really doesn't do all that much except for bookend the story it's as to telling him to not go east at the start of the story and then still being alive at the end of the story when the boy comes back. Uh, he goes out hunting and do, 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 he goes, eventually he goes around playing and just after just time just of him not or a time of him following the direction, he decides to not follow the direction and to go to the East Lake. Uh, he meets a man there and just stay, they start conversing a little bit. Where do you come from? Uh, that sort of thing. And I, I immediately just got like, oh, okay, stranger, possible allegory to White Invader aspect or some sort of thing. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. But they, uh, the man asked if he'd like to sh- uh, practice shooting arrows. So they shot arrows in the air. The, the nephews, the little boys, went higher. Um, who, let's see who can swim farther without breathing. The nephew went high, uh, went farther. And then he's like, let's go into my canoe and look at the pretty birds. And they set off the canoe and they arrive on this little island and get to the island. And uh, again, older story. So they get out of the boat and swim to shore. Basically, he's kind of like abandoned on this island. And there he meets this skeleton that's kind of just in the beach, in the sand. In this skeleton starts giving him advice, starts telling him what to do. It's like, hey, uh, stay still, listen. Um, you have done what I've done. You've met this man, you've done what you, you know, you've played his games, you did listen to him, and you came to here with me. Uh, if you help me, I will help you. Uh, t- the skeleton tells him to go to a certain tree and dig on the west side of it, specific detail that I took note of. He found a pipe, tobacco, and flint, basically things that need to, uh, for smoking. The boy brings it back, puts the pipe in his mouth his mouth, and uh, lights it for him and lets the skeleton smoke, which obviously has probably uh, ritual or religious connections or, or aspects about that. Uh, and this, uh, this skeleton kind of gives him advice that this man is going to come back with dogs to try to kill you run around the island, oh, no. going in and out of the cu- out of the water, and then hide in the hollow of a tree so he doesn't find you. Guy comes back with dogs, releases the dogs, they run all the way around the island, come back with nothing, he gets mad and immediately kills a dog. So this guy is major A asshole to me. Then, whatever, either the guy goes home and comes back for the next day or whatever, and the, uh, the skeleton tells him, uh, now you must hide by the... By the by, the canoe, steal his canoe, and and go save your sister. So now suddenly there's like a sister, and he listens to the skeleton, manages to get away, follows the skeleton advice that that was provided to him, and manages to find his sister and return back to his uncle, uh, and uh, uh, and eventually uh, get the sister away from the bad man, who is also just like the bad guy who kidnapped his sister. Which is you know maybe there's some sort of old story where some guy came in and stole a daughter and then tried to steal a boy as well and ended up being his undoing. I don't know, it was just... Uh, he takes the sister back to the island, meets the skeleton, you are brave, you find your sister, uh, gather up my bones, put them in a pile, and push them into the largest tree uh, largest tree you see, and then call out, all dead people arise. And the skeleton arose, with many others out of the ground, so, uh, just some describing only having one arm or one leg, but they all had bows and arrows. And then they so go this home. Guy teach him to be a necromancer. I, that, honestly, that's it's like it sounds like it, but it was basically like them his story of being gone for ten years, like away from his uncle, and now he comes home with with his the niece as well, and uh, they build a new house. They learned of the healing of the dead. Those who are different hold healings that help us all. Many who are considered physically or mentally unusual can have special healings if they are observed and understood. Though our differences, through our differences, we learn who we are and what makes us whole. It's kind of the wrapping up story, which maybe yeah. maybe the idea is to respect the, either the dead or the infirm for their wisdom is still wisdom. I don't know. It's it's again allegorical to the extreme. But have you ever heard that story before? I've never heard that story okay. before. I would be interested to see like what your mom or your or your nana or, or whomever, whomever your family if they've ever heard anything like that. Um, obviously, I'm have to talk to them. Obviously, it's it's an Iroquois myth, which like the Iroquois, the Seneca is like one sixth of that. So there's a lot of leeway for it not even being anywhere in your sphere or of influence by any means. But 
uh, I figured it was the closest connection in this book that I could easily find, but there are plenty of other stories, and I would love to share more of them with you as we go. That was a good story. I, I didn't know where it was going until you wrapped it up at the end. I was, oh, yeah. We shouldn't judge and hate each other based off our differences. Instead, we can learn and respect each other from that. Oh, my God. I mean, I, I, I like that, but... Necromancer. Uh, oh, okay, I do like the necromancer take on it, too. Just like, hey, you should learn how to be a necromancer with the dead because we rock. I'm uh, like, uh, but no, <laughs> I honestly, the... That, I mean, that kind of thing might also have been the way stories grow, like a game of telephone, that kind of wrap-up um, presentation as to, like, this is what they learn. That, uh, that might also be a very Western way of thinking that was eventually slapped on at the end of it because people didn't either have the context of knowing all the rest of your tribe's stories and then hearing this one and understanding, okay, this makes sense in our, in the context of our tribe, because that's just obvious to all of us. A lot of people don't really think about how, when cultures get so convoluted within themselves, they stop explaining certain aspects of that culture just because it's uh it's just assumed to be known by all there like there, there's there's no need to explain this there's never going to be an outside perspective that's not going to understand this this is just a truth that we all know um and a lot of times it's stuff like grammar or um in like ancient ancient history especially like uh some of our oldest histories like ancient egypt and stuff it's like events that like oh everyone in this year of records was mentioning like the Methuseling and whatever. And like everyone knew, knew what the Methuseling was. And like, that's just, that's an example I pulled out of my butt, but like, that's the kind of thing where oh, yeah. everyone knows where it was. Why would we explain it every time? It would just take too long. We put it, we gave a name to it. Everyone knows the Methuseling, just use the name. Like, uh, but that's kind <laughs> of in history. That doesn't, that doesn't really work because that's Methuseling isn't a thing. Oh, you mean the tsunami, right. the tsunami that hit that year, that, the year of of Methuselah, or like I don't know, like yeah, to be Methuseled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a verb. It, yeah, and, and, and even so, like the way that human language develops, that also is an aspect where those things do become verbs. And now we have, well, like honestly, even just hearing like what what uh, words were added to like the English dictionary this past year of like memeing, or just like things that are just seem to be colloquialisms or just current trends are then accepted to be part of our language as a whole. This is very strange. That is strange. I didn't think that meme was going to make it in there. I like how uh, the historical connection leads <laughs> all the way up to memes being added to the dictionary. There was 370 new words added to the dictionary in September. What? Really? Uh-huh. Some things like microgrid or supply chain but things like, oh, this was it, laggy. Oh, my, uh, yeah. Like, I guess lag was already in the dictionary, now laggy, just a different version of the word. Uh, <laughs> virtual signaling. Virtual, that word in its own right. I'm sorry, I'm probably... sorry, I said it wrong. But it, it was in the virtual section, but this is a virtual, virtue signaling. The art or practice of conspicuously displaying one's awareness of and attentiveness to political issue matters of social and racial justice, success, or etc., uh, especially instead of taking effective action. So, like, words that are just based on the, the, the new political climate and just the what I consider the natural evolution of, or the natural changing of our society just gets accepted into our lexicon. Right, no, that makes sense. Laggy, meme... GIF or GIF, depending on what side of the the lake you're on. Um, <laughs> damn, that's interesting. I really have to look into that skeleton oh, boy story. Oh. Okay, sorry. Last one. Last, because there's a slang. Uh, two, two more. Yeet and Janky. They did not add Yeet. No, oh, he did. Webster, oh my god. Marion Webster. <laughs> yeet. You can say it now. It's I, not. It's not a. It's it's not just some some stupid teen thing. It's a, it's a slang. My kids heard me saying that once, and now every time something's exciting, they scream it. 
they absolutely yell at them. <laughs> Boys, relax. No, no, and stop, no. They they heard be, they were we me and Sierra were watching anime the other night and they heard funny and I explained what, to them what that was. What and was it? Now I'm sorry, they use you, it. You cut out. What did you what did they hear? Nani. Nani. Like, Nani. Yeah. They're saying that every day now. Oh. <laughs> Because I, because I told them this is what it means. It's like what, and they're like, oh, nani? <laughs> what, what does it mean? It's like uh, it's uh. I'm scared. So, the English version would be if you're surprised about something, you'd be like, what? Or ah, uh, okay. What the f? Yeah. And and that's yeah. Now they say nani all the time and ye and. <laughs> They're, I love them. They're, I love them so they're gonna have a very strange existence. Oh, I'm sure my parents thought that about me too when I was getting into Pokemon. And... Oh, and you are. Oh yeah, you absolutely are. <laughs> I'll put that top hat on. Is it strange across it? Heck yeah, I'll smile. Uh, <laughs> just to wrap up our skeleton story, I did find one uh, link that uh, did have. Um, it seemed like it was more like a like a like a, a thesis like online or, or some sort of like essay written online um, that has if you just search skeleton within the the website it will have a basis of the story or at least a different version of the story um, maybe I can just copy it now nah, I want to have the site in just for reference uh, but okay. there's also other stories in there that you can also check out that I also might want to check out myself but other than that, is there anything else going on, Al, that you want to chat about? I We're, we're almost at time, and I, I still have plenty of other books and stuff I can pull out any time. <laughs> the, only, the only thing that I wanted to bring up was when you, when you were first starting the Skeleton Boy story and you were listing off all the different tribes, my, my brain went into, like, five-year-old mode. And I was... <laughs> you were listing off the tribes, and I was... My my brain made the connection of this is like the Pokemon song oh when God. they list off all the different Pokemon. <laughs> oh heck, Cheyenne, Navajo, Seneca. No! <laughs> it's like, oh no, not my five year old brain again. Al, yeah. can, that can't that can't be true because then it, well, right, if it's if that's true, then we have to change the line. Gotta catch them all cannot be the line. No, it's not. <laughs> What do we what do we gotta do with the tribes? Gotta what them all? Accept them all. Gotta accept them all. Oh, that is beautiful. I love it. Gotta accept them all. Native tribes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my god. Your brain, your brain is a genius place to be in, and I love it. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's like a skeleton, or not a skeleton, a spider web. Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, because shit just gets stuck up in there. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well. When it's going to connect. <laughs> it, it, it eventually will. If anything, just all falls apart and that's it all in one jumble. And there it all is. It's all connected. <laughs> I'll be 60. It's a cobweb now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, train your brain because that's eventually, it's all just going to fall apart. Ugh, scary. Anyway, <laughs> this has been a mess, uh, but it's been talking two ways. Thank you for listening. Thank you uh, for sticking around with us throughout this craziness. If you have any ideas for topics for us in the future that can beat corn, good luck, but uh, send us to it, send us that in comments and we will, we will try to top this gold that we've presented to you today. If you could beat corn, leave it in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it, man. Many nyalis, everyone. It's Konge. Good night, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Talking Two Ways podcast. Al and I really appreciate your time. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in a review on whatever platform you found us on. Any review would be a major talking point and we would really appreciate it. If you have tattoos and are into quality aftercare products, check out Lucky 13 Tattoo Aftercare. They make natural balms and cleansers that are cruelty-free, vegan, and really make colors and blacks stand out in the best way possible. If you want to see for yourself, check out protectyourink.com and use the discount code TALNESS300 for 25% off everything on the site. Thanks for listening.